still crying on the yeah. sideline yeah. when the when the cameras panned over there. You know, if you had any any question of what these games mean to a to a superstar, possibly the greatest player of our times, uh, perhaps because some of his teammates, this is the last time he's gonna gonna play with at least a couple of them, and who knows how many more he has left with Argentina. But Argentina pulling out another win and doing it about the last 60 minutes without Messi yeah. was the story for Courtney me. Cronin. The match was overshadowed by an unmitigated disaster, and Hard Rock Stadium has hosted the Super Bowl. It's hosted the college football playoffs. It's hosted a national championship. There's been an F1 race there. There have been other international soccer events inside the stadium. The common denominator here is Conmebol, the international organizer of this event, and they deserve the majority of the blame. When you have fans pushed up against the railing to where they're having to hand their children over so they don't get crushed, within this, what they're trying to prevent being a stampede, it really sheds light on how just out of control international soccer can become. I understand that part of the vibe of international soccer is having all of these unticketed fans that does not give you license to act barbaric, to scale the stadium to get in, to crawl through a ventilation system, to push and shove and cause a near disaster. I'm glad today, Tony, that we're not talking about any deaths, any serious injuries that came from this. We should be very thankful that this ended the way that it did without any serious trouble beyond what we saw in the delay yesterday, but hell, this is a serious black eye on Conmebol, and I really hope that for the World Cup, FIFA does a far better job than this. David Dennis Jr. Yeah, we had a game that was overshadowed by the devastation of Messi's tears, which was overshadowed by the calamity and the danger that was happening outside as people were trying to get in. The image of the stadium, inside the stadium, where you couldn't even see the, the walkways because there were so many fans, up to seven thousand unticketed fans somewhere in that stadium that was a loss of control the powers that be mishandled this entire situation there are images police hitting people with batons children are bleeding folks are on the ground they're worried about suffocating there is no excuse for this to happen and at that, the point where these images are flooding social media i'm wondering if this game should have even taken place at all with what was going on. This cannot happen. This cannot be the precedent. I'm worried about what's going to happen, uh, you know, when the World Cup comes to America and how prepared we're going to be. My hope is that this is a warning and that mm -hmm. they ramp mm -hmm. up whatever security, whatever parameters they need to do, because this cannot be happening. Anymore. You wonder if they should have postponed the game. This is interesting to me because we saw this prominently three years ago in the Euros, right, with England hosting. Now, this is, again, England, a country that knows how to host a soccer game, had nearly the same situation with the breach at the entrance gates. They shut it down. Some real chaotic moments that game went on as well. You almost have to ask yourself, if they were to call the game, would that lead to a more chaotic scene with possible more danger? Kevin Blackison, I'll bring you in here. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, to me, the whole thing was just make sure the fans are safe. Right. Just bring down the gates so the people don't get crushed and you don't have a, a tragedy. Um, and, then cons and then you can think about playing the game later. As it was, you had people sitting in the aisle, sitting on the stairs. Had something horrible happened, a fire or something like that, they couldn't have gotten out. But I will say this. You know, I was at the World Cup when it was here in 94. I covered that. I don't recall any incidents. It was run by FIFA. 2016, Euros were here in this country. They were not run by Conneball. They were run yeah. by, uh, by U.S. soccer and another organization. Once again, I don't recall any problems. So I'm going to say this is a one-off, but it is also an eye-opener to what can happen if you don't control the situation properly. And clearly last night, that was a trap. Forty and last word. This happened four days after a fan... Uh, you know, fans from yeah, Colombia and players from Uruguay got into a brawl in Charlotte. That should have been a wake-up call then. The fact that we end up having all of this calamity four days later shows me that Conmebol cannot be trusted to put on another international event. And you hope that there are some changes to their board of governors, more or less, so this stuff does not happen at another Copa America in the future. That was the end result of the affair before. The final score, Argentina winning and hoisting yet another trophy. And now we talk about the victors from the weekend, Argentina and Spain. Spain beating England in the Euro final. The late goal, the later head out, a thrilling finish. 
Was this about Spain and their dominance through the whole tournament or about England's failure to win one once again? Kevin Blackstone, around the horn to you. Well, to me, it's about Spain's dominance, but of course, everybody wants to talk about England, and sometimes I wonder why. I mean, they haven't won a major championship uh, since 1966, and it's as, it's as if they have some sort of birthright um, to being the champions of soccer. The fact of the matter is, is that when I watch England play, I don't watch it. For, I don't watch them play from the edge of my couch. They don't excite me. You look at the last game that they played. How many passes did they have? 200 and some, I forget the number. Spain had twice as many. They make things happen. They have players that when the ball is on their boot, you want to see what they're going to do. They don't pass the ball well. They don't attack. And that's what makes them, that's what makes them I shouldn't say losers, because they're not losers, but that's what makes their team, their side, come up a little bit short. Spain, on the other hand, that was exciting to watch. And they are the best soccer country in the world right now with what they've won in this century. Mm. And, okay, yes. Right, because Argentina also has, has an intercontinental and a World Cup yep. in Spain. Now with their third Euro in, in the last 16 years, David Dennis Jr., around the horn to you. Yeah, this is about Spain's dominance. I mean, I kind of figured they were going to win when Frank Isola tweeted that it would be a guarantee that Colombia and England were both going to uh, win yesterday. So I kind of was waiting for this, oh my this victory oh. from our, uh, our, so when our soccer This was interesting uh, to me because he there. picked the opposite on our show. Frank, what are you doing out yeah, here? Well, you know, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Yeah, yeah, besides that, yeah, this is about Spain and their dominance and what they were able to do. Most points, uh, 15 points uh, goal scored in this tournament. Uh, you know, they didn't lose at, at all uh, the whole time. And the way that they played as a team, only three players, according to the Guardian, who listed the top players in the tournament, only three players were in the top 70, and they didn't even finish out this tournament. The way that they pulled together and showed their dominance and, again, uh, played like the best team in the world, this is about Spain more than anything. Courtney Cronin. This is about the beginning of what's to come for Spain. Take a look at this core. You have Lamine Yamal, who's 17 years old right now, uh, wins like MVP for the youngest player in the tournament, has the record-setting goal against France and then assists on Nico Williams' yep. goal yesterday. Rodri is one of the best players in the world at 28 years old. Williams is 22. And, and Williams and Yamal weren't even regular starters for Spain up until a couple of months ago. So to watch this young core, and now Spain with four Euro titles and what's to come for this team in the future, I feel like they're going to be on a tear for the next couple of years, whereas England kind of feels like the New York Yankees with a $300 million play payroll that really goes mm. Not even that good. Tim Kalashaw. <laughs> you know, those of us who, through 23andMe, have traced our genealogy to Sheffield, England, know <laughs> that this is where the game was invented, the modern uh, game. Yes, yes, we've heard so yes, much people about this. had variations of kicking a ball around a field in other countries. Soccer was invented. Modern soccer was invented in England. They farmed out all their coaches to teach it to the world, and they forgot how to play it in the process. <laughs> and Kevin is right. They play the most boring style uh, in the world, and they come close, but they don't deliver. Uh, Galisha, 14. Yo. Sheffield, England's finest. Gordy Cronin, 8. David Dennis Jr., cooking up some points there. 8. The Blackstone, the lead, 15. Fire cell next. Beaver Lynx rivalry is kind of spicy in Indiana over Minnesota yesterday afternoon. Aaliyah Boston had a huge game, and Kelsey Mitchell had the play to put it away. But I want to talk about Caitlin Clark working the crowd here. Remember, this is in Minnesota, and the heat between Clark and Lynx coach Cheryl Reeve with Reeve's preseason remarks, and then Reeve, the Olympic team coach, and her selections, and Clark not on the team. Before the game, Reeve didn't want to address Clark and her future on the national team, saying, why the hell would I answer a national team question? Also said she didn't give two bleeps about the potential for a pro fever crowd. But after the game, Reeve's tone changed somewhat, said the reason why the league is having sellouts is Clark coming to town, said similar for Angel Reese, compared it to Bird and Magic. So, Courtney, do you have a takeaway? 
Cheryl Reeves going to be in for a rude awakening in Paris when these questions come about from international reporters who are just joining the conversation about the makeup of Team USA and Caitlin Clark being left off the team. I understand she may have fatigue over addressing this subject. My esteemed colleague, Myron Medcalf, asked this question at the most appropriate time. You're not going to ask this after a loss, which the Lynx lost this game last night. You ask it pre-game. Her reaction to this was just flat out weird. And next week when she is asked these questions ad nauseum, I hope she has a different answer. David Dennis Jr. This should have been a layup of an answer. Like the, the question was the future of Kaylin Clark on Team USA. Yes, she's going to make the team at some point. I have no clue why Reeve decided to answer the question the way that she did with the expletive and saying she doesn't care. Why wouldn't you want a player of her caliber who has the potential to be great being on this team in the future? I don't understand why she would answer that way. And I, and I hate the fact that it took away from that game and what Clark and the Fever are doing. Clark played a tremendous game, score, being responsible for the first 14 points that team scored in the fourth quarter. Aaliyah Boston, 17 and 16. This team is playing really good right now, and they're in the playoffs. We should be talking about that instead of those really weird comments. Yeah, some black stone. Well, you know, I remember Bill Parcells. If you asked him a question about a team, a player that was on injury reserve and was going to play, he would always tell you, I don't talk about players who aren't playing. So here's Cheryl Reeve, the greatest coach in the history of the WNBA, being asked a question not about the team she's coaching that particular night, not about a team who's a player who's even on their, her okay. roster. And to Courtney's point, she's probably heard this over and over again, and the fatigue is probably caught up with her. She'll be fine when she's in Paris. She knows what so to do. So you're all right with but how I can... she responded even the first time, and then the change of tone. Yeah. The second time, Kevin, this is the, the coach who also prominently tweeted the first week of the right. season where more than just one player for her now to acknowledge the way she did. Clark? And yeah, her PR be, person probably put an arm around her and said, hey, can you calm it down in the postgame yeah, interview you think, Okay, well, that's bit. in play, too. Tip Kalishaw, your takeaway from it? That's a noble <clears throat> effort by my morning former morning news colleague and sweet mate noble. across the hall. <clears throat> but just think about that answer. Why the hell would I answer a national team question? Maybe because you're the national team coach <laughs> and the team goes to Paris next week to play in the Olympics and you're selling your sport. Good God. That, that's a ridiculous thing to say, even if it doesn't involve Kate. One thing that should be said about this, the heat in this robbery, too, is I, Clark grew up a Minnesota Lynx fan and playing in Iowa. The Lynx are one of the closer teams and you get that. That crowd once again for a game, and that's what she's waving at at the back end. But I'm sure there was a little relish on that with Reeve on the other side. It's all good. This is the stuff we love about sports, right? We'll move on by ourselves too. The way operates Grub Djokovic. Straight set de demolition. This was a rematch for the Wimbledon final, but it was no match. And Alcaraz now. Tim, is that it? Has the torch not just been passed, but snatched forever? This is the stuff we love about sports, Tony. Mm -hmm. We all wondered what's going to happen when Roger and Rafa and Djokovic with their 20 and 22 and 24 grand slams, when they're gone. Two of those guys are gone. Novak's 37, just had knee surgery. And now we have the most incredible athlete of all of them who already has four at the age of 21. A year ago, he struggled in the match but beat, but beat Novak yesterday. He broke serve in the first game and, and basically destroyed him for two sets and then beat him with a tie break in the third. Carlos Alcaraz's time has arrived. Cronin. He's magnificent. Alcaraz was so good against Djokovic, trying to compensate for that meniscus injury he's recovering from the surgery, that the points that he got at the net dropped by 21% yesterday compared to where he was throughout this tournament. So the level of dominance that we're seeing against somebody last year, this was a five-hour back-and-forth match. It honestly felt given the circumstances that Alcaraz made pretty quick and light work of Novak Djokovic in three sets. David Dennis Jr., have we seen the torch not just passed, but snatched? Yeah, absolutely. Tennis is just a remarkable sport in the way that for pretty much my entire lifetime, whenever a GOAT leaves the sport, 
another one just pops up and takes their place from Sampras to Federer that all the way amazing. here to Alcaraz. It's the dream of professional exactly sports. Exactly that. You're right about right. that. It's what every sport dreams of having, right? And so now you have Alcaraz who beat Djokovic in straight sets. Djokovic losing in straight sets in Wimbledon. That's the first time that's happened in 11 years. Djokovic is 50 and 2 in center court. The two losses against Alcaraz, who is just as dynamic and exciting as any athlete you will see for his age, and he is the new leader alpha male of this sport. Blackstone. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got to love what he's doing, and it is dominant. I mean, he's now won the French and Wimbledon in the same year, joining that pantheon uh, over the last 40 years when you're talking about Federer, Djokovic, and Nadal. So um, this, is in, this is pretty incredible stuff we were watching, and he's living up to the hype. Remember, he just hit our radar like two seasons ago, and now look where he is. Mm-hmm. Gordon Cronin, David Dennis Jr. Look at seat back there and watch this showdown of these former sweet mates at the Dallas Morning News. I didn't know you guys shared an office. Tyler Jones, Blackstone. Next. It wasn't really a sweet now that I think of it. <laughs> former roommates or sweet mates or whatever it was. Kalisha Blackstone, this is their 80th career showdown matchup. <laughs> the head-to-head. Kalisha 45. Blackstone 34. What? Let's go. Goodness. Angel Reese's double fun. double streak ended this weekend, and it was something. Final seconds. Again. Having a really good rookie year. That should be that should be the focus, and I think it is for her. She's pro- she should be relieved. This thing is finally over. Kevin Blackstone. Good grief! She's that close to a record, and that's what they do in a game that's decided. Put four four people on her to stop her from getting it. Just play the game through. Be competitive. That's not right. Come on. Wouldn't that be Cheap. competitive to play defense to the end? Well, like you did the entire rest of the game. If Not she's trying to get moment. points, they should be trying to stop her. That's the. This is, again, why we play the game. We'll move on. Showdown, too. The way the Dodgers and Yankees hit the bricks for this all-star break. Hitting the break, struggling, and epically losing games this weekend. Miscues on miscues. The Yankees could have had a sweep of Baltimore but gave it away. The Dodgers' losses on Saturday and Sunday were atrocious. Who... Up chucked worse going to the break, Evan. Oh, it's got to be the Yankees for me. I mean, because they are in a division that is competitive with the Orioles and look behind them, and somehow 53 wins are coming out of Boston. So it's mm-hmm. def- definitely the Yankees. You see? I'm going to give it to the Dodgers. They had a five run lead going to the ninth inning in Detroit. The Dodgers actually have a worse record than the Yankees do right now. They just happen to play in a division where Arizona is seven games behind them. The Dodgers are playing poorly. Point Blackstone, showdown three. What the A's did to the Phillies yesterday. They hit eight home runs. Eight home runs, both by a team in 25 years. Credit the A's, blame the Phillies, or credit to the all-star getaway and jet stream in that stadium in Philadelphia, Tim. I'm crediting Oakland. Rooker's already having a good year, but Lawrence Butler is a good rookie. He had three of those. Started off the season poorly, went back to AAA, He's been hitting great since he came Evan back. Blackstone? Man, I hate to agree with Tim. I never did when we were in the office together, but he's absolutely right. I mean, the A's are one of the better home run hitting teams in the major leagues right now, and they toasted they toasted that pitching last night. Is this your first showdown, Blackstone? You agreed with Kalashaw in the final showdown? Going it was a better the- agreement. I pointed out the team in totality. TC, take the FaceTime. Oh, my. This is... So easy sometimes. <laughs> Speaking of home runs, here in Arlington, a new and improved home run derby is being touted for you tonight. And I am excited. Bobby Witt Jr., Teoscar Hernandez, some of the guys getting their first home run derby. Pete Alonzo, it's not his first home run derby. It's all the guy does. <laughs> new and improved. They still have uh, the pitch clock, the timer clock. They got to go back to the outs. Because you can't watch, the player can't watch the home runs going into the crowd. That moment with Josh Hamilton, Yankee Stadium, that was the best ever. You'll be That's there? what I've been losing to? Those types of FaceTimes? I'm not going to make it tonight, Tony. 